I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. Why has COVID-19 been such a challenging virus to overcome? We'll get an inside perspective from a leading immunologist. This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. When you come down with a virus, your immune system speeds into action. What's the difference between the innate and the adaptive branches of the immune system? How do they interact to protect you? We've been taught to lower a fever whenever we have an infection, but that might be counterproductive. Our guest is both an immunologist and a virologist, and he'll tell you why. What role does inflammation play in fighting infection? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, how does your immune system overcome viruses? In the People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, public health authorities are encouraging everyone to get a flu shot. They warn that having two respiratory infections this winter could be bad. Another incentive, Dutch scientists suspect that influenza vaccinations might provide some protection against COVID-19. The quadrivalent flu vaccine seems to activate the innate immune system in addition to teaching the adaptive immune system to recognize and repel influenza viruses. Dutch hospital workers vaccinated against flu in late 2019 were less likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 than those who did not get a flu shot. This study is observational rather than a randomized controlled trial. In addition, it has not undergone peer review. Nonetheless, if the flu vaccine offers some COVID-19 protection, that would be a bonus. In South Korea, People are worried about getting their flu shots this winter. That's because there have been reports of serious reactions, including 59 deaths following vaccination. Singapore has responded by temporarily halting use of two of the vaccines. In Taiwan, a 51-year-old man suffered a serious neurological syndrome called Guillain-Barre. The health authorities are trying to determine whether his illness is related to his flu shot. British scientists are reporting that antibodies to COVID-19 seem to fade with time. They tested more than 365,000 people with a blood test to detect antibodies. A positive result indicates past infection with SARS-CoV-2. Over three months, between June and September, the number of people with positive tests went from 6% down to 4.4%. Antibody prevalence was higher in London and in younger people. The investigators are concerned about this apparent decline in antibody levels. No one knows whether a reduction in antibodies leaves people more vulnerable to a second infection of the virus. A lowered immune response would create concerns regarding the concept of herd immunity. Face masks continue to be a hot-button issue for many Americans. There have been relatively few controlled experiments to test their effectiveness against the transmission of COVID-19. But an unplanned natural experiment from Kansas suggests that masks may indeed reduce the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2. Investigators at the University of Kansas tracked the incidence of COVID-19 across the state after the governor mandated that every citizen wear a mask in public if they could not maintain a distance of more than six feet from other people. Eighty counties ignored the governor's mandate. Twenty-one counties adopted the plan, though there was some variability in when they began participation. The researchers tracked cases of COVID-19 between July and October. In the 80 counties where officials did not adopt the mask mandate, Cases climbed from 10 per 100,000 residents to almost 40 per 100,000. In the counties where the mask mandate was adopted, cases have plateaued since July at approximately 20 per 100,000 residents. The lead investigator noted that a 50% reduction in a virus that's very contagious is huge. Although masks did not provide perfect protection, they did slow the spread of the virus in places that tried to follow the governor's directive. 
There's growing evidence to support the role of vitamin D in susceptibility to COVID-19. Spanish scientists analyzed blood samples for 25-hydroxy vitamin D in hospitalized patients who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. They found that patients diagnosed with COVID-19 had significantly lower levels of the vitamin D biomarker than population-based controls. 82.2% of the coronavirus-positive patients were considered deficient in this essential nutrient. The authors suggest that people at high risk for COVID-19, such as older people and those with comorbidities, as well as nursing home residents, be encouraged to keep vitamin D levels between 30 and 50 nanograms per ml to prevent vitamin D deficiency. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The most important health story of the year, if not of the century, is the coronavirus pandemic that's been sweeping the globe. Scientists have learned a lot about the spiky little bundle of RNA, but its impact on people is highly variable. To understand why... We need to know more about our immune system and how it tries to overcome foreign invaders like viruses. We've spoken to the coronavirus hunter, Dr. Ralph Barrick, about the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. We've also interviewed Dr. Paul Offit, one of the country's leading vaccinologists. Today's guest is both an immunologist and a virologist. We thought you would want to know more about how your immune system responds to viruses. Dr. Michael Gale Jr. is a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale's research laboratory is focused on understanding the processes that trigger and control innate immunity and inflammation to program the immune response against RNA virus infections. He and his colleagues also seek to define the virus-host interactions that control viral replication and the outcome of infection and immunity. They're part of the Consortium for the Development and Advancement of Broad-Spectrum Respiratory antivirals, which are what we need in part to overcome the coronavirus. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Michael Gale. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Dr. Gale, I I think a lot of people have learned something about both virology and immunology as a result of COVID-19. But there are still more questions than answers. You are both an immunologist and a virologist. Can you kind of give us a sense of of what those fields represent for our listeners? Yes, I'm happy to do that. So, of course, virology is the study of viruses and study of the virus itself. What is it? How does it replicate what it's made out of? And immunology, on the other hand, is the study of the immune system. In the big picture scenario, it's the whole body and how it builds immunity to invaders. So I study the interaction between viruses and the immune system. We often refer to this as virus-host interactions because the infected cell or a person is the host of the virus. The goal of the immune system is to get rid of the virus and uh, bring health back to the body. So that's how we think about viruses and and host. Well, there are a lot of different kinds of viruses, but my understanding is that it was a specific virus, a hepatitis A virus, that got you interested in this field. Could you elaborate, please? Yeah, this was actually years ago. I was a I was a grade school kid, and there was a hepatitis A virus outbreak at my school. Apparently, it was passed through food, contaminated food, and several children and teachers ate the food and got sick. I ate the food, got a little sick. My sister was bedridden, and her home was quarantined 
you know, for a couple of weeks until she got better and, and the rest of us were cleared by the health department as not being contagious. But in the meantime, a teacher died and several students died. And I think this is documented pretty well in, in our local public health records for the county that we were living in at the time. But the point is, I spent a lot of time thinking about what happened because I knew those people who succumbed to the virus. And over the years, it just kept me interested in un trying to understand what a virus is and, and eventually how we can study them and how can we, you know, stop them. Well, I think our listeners are familiar with viruses to a certain extent. I mean, we, we know that there are, what, a couple of hundred cold viruses, uh, things like rhinoviruses. And, you know, most of us have had a cold, maybe a lot more than one. And after a week or 10 days, we get better and we move on and then we get another one and we cope with it somehow. And we've learned about things like AIDS and we've now learned far more than we ever wanted to know about coronaviruses. So perhaps you can give us a sense of what is a virus? How does it differ from a bacterium or, or fungi? And why is it that sometimes we can deal with a virus pretty easily, like with a cold, and other times it can be devastating? Yeah, those are all terrific questions. I'll start with what is a virus, and viruses are very different from bacteria or other parasites, for that matter, like malaria. Viruses need the cell to replicate their genetic material, whereas bacteria and parasites, they replicate their own material, but they do infect humans. The virus we call it an obligate intracellular parasite, it means it needs to be inside of a living cell and it parasitizes the actions of the cell. That means it co-ops them for its own resources to replicate its genome and make new viruses. So you can think of a virus as a very small piece of nucleic acid. There's a lot of viruses that have DNA genomes. Those are <clears throat> excuse me, viruses like herpes virus, pox viruses, human papilloma virus. Those are DNA viruses. They have DNA genomes. There are many, many more viruses that have RNA genomes. And we call these, of course, we classify them as RNA viruses. This coronavirus happens to be an RNA virus. Now, a virus is a piece of genetic material that's surrounded by specific proteins to protect it. And then oftentimes when a virus leaves an infected cell, it acquires part of that cell's membrane. We call those envelope viruses. The viruses that leave the cell through other processes sometimes don't have an envelope, and we call them naked viruses or capsid viruses. But the point is, it's the vironucleic acid that encodes all of the directions, instructions to program the cell to replicate more virus. And in addition to that, the genetic material also often in viruses that make us sick provides instructions to tell the virus how to suppress or regulate the immune response so that the virus can regulate, can replicate without being shut down by the immune response of the person or the cell that it's replicating in. And it's the battle between the virus and the host, the cell and the person's body that eventually will determine who wins if a person gets sick or if the virus gets eliminated. And when we get sick, it's because in part our immune response pushed the virus out. But while it did that, it generated actions that made us feel sick, that were unpleasant while we had to go through the infection. The people who have succumbed to COVID, on the other hand, it's a combination. Their outcome was a combination of the virus facilitating tissue destruction and also their own immune response being out of control. How do our immune uh, systems actually 
figure out that there's a viral invasion happening? They have to know that there's a virus present. So basically, how does the body know it's infected is a great question. And it comes, that really presents the premise of immunity. Immunity is all about discrimination of non-self, foreign invaders from self. So in our genome, we encode several genes that make proteins called path we call them pathogen recognition receptors. And these are molecules that are made by most of the cells in our body and they're present to recognize foreign invaders. So there are pathogen recognition receptors that are specific to recognize bacteria, parasites, viruses, different flavors of viruses, like I said, the DNA or the RNA viruses, and so on. And there's even pathogen recognition receptors that we think are specialized to recognizing worm infections. So these pathogen recognition receptors, their job is to recognize foreign, what we call pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or just other molecules that are embedded within a virus or a bacteria or whatever might be infecting the body. And then these pathogen recognition receptor molecules physically recognize the presence of the PAMP, we call it, the, the viral molecule, and can bind to it. And when it binds to it, it leads to what we call innate immune activation. And that pathogen recognition receptor binding to the foreign molecule sets off a whole series of events that eventually will lead to the immune response, in this case, against virus infection. So the recognition of the virus is completely dependent on the fact that the cells in our body produce these pathogen recognition receptors that can recognize and react to the presence of the virus and the molecules that it presents when it replicates in our cells. You're listening to Dr. Michael Gale, Jr. He's a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale is an immunologist and virologist. He focuses his research on understanding the molecular mechanisms of innate immune response and immune programming against infection by RNA viruses, including the emerging SARS-CoV-2, emerging flaviviruses, HIV, and influenza viruses. After the break, find out how the immune system can differentiate between self and non-self to protect against invading pathogens. How do digestive tract bacteria fly under the radar of the immune system? We'll learn how the innate immune system goes into action immediately at the first possible sign of trouble. What can we do to support the immune system and keep it working well? Does vitamin D play a role in the immune system? New research suggests people low in this vitamin may be more vulnerable to COVID-19. Find out why you might not want to knock a fever down. There are times when the immune system creates inflammation to protect us from invaders. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy podcast is supported in part by Cocovia Memory Plus. Cocovia cocoflavanols support both cardiovascular health and cognitive function by promoting healthy blood flow, transporting oxygen and nutrients to vital organs and muscles, including your heart and brain. Cocovia Memory Plus has 750 milligrams of cocoflavanols, the plant-based nutrients from fresh cocoa that have been proven to help boost memory. Cocovia Memory Plus is backed by four clinical trials that demonstrate improvement in three different aspects of memory, long-term memory, spatial memory, and word recall. The studies show improved brain function in just eight weeks. You can try the benefits of Cocovia Memory Plus with a 25% discount off your first month. Use the code PEOPLES25. To get the full benefits, take it daily for eight weeks. Cocovia is offering People's Pharmacy podcast listeners a 10% discount on subscriptions. That code is PEOPLES10. Learn more at cocovia.com. Well, 
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Coco Via Memory Plus, a cocoa flavanol supplement backed by four clinical studies that show significant improvement in three different aspects of memory. More information at cocovia.com. Also by Verizana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome, now with an annual health club plan. Online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com slash health dash club. Have you been wondering how your immune system can tell the difference between invaders, such as pathogenic viruses or bacteria, and non-threatening microbes? We'll ask our guest how the body distinguishes between self and non-self. We're talking with Dr. Michael Gale, Jr. He's a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale's research laboratory is focused on understanding the processes that trigger and control innate immunity and inflammation to program the immune response against RNA virus infections. He and his colleagues are part of the Consortium for the Development and Advancement of Broad-Spectrum Respiratory Antivirals. Dr. Gale, you mentioned something that has absolutely intrigued me for quite a long time now. You mentioned self versus non-self, and that the body has the ability to recognize non-self as foreign and potentially threatening, a pathogen, a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, a worm. But here's the rub. when a woman is pregnant, she's got non-self. She, she's got a baby that may be genetically different from her, and she doesn't want to attack that. But perhaps even more important, we are told that we have trillions of bacteria in our digestive tracts that are non-self. They're, they're foreign. And now we know there's a microbiome in our lungs, there's a microbiome in our brains, there's a microbiome in our sinuses, there's a microbiome just about everywhere in our bodies, including our kidneys, and in that microbiome, there's non-self. So how is it that our immune systems are so smart that they can determine the dangerous non-self from the innocuous, in quotes, non-self? Yeah, those are terrific questions. Why do bacteria, you know, live in us, the microbiome, when they're actually non-self? There's complex answers to that. First part of the question is the bacteria are present in our gut, basically present everywhere on our body, you know, and the body has... um developed. Um, some some people may say uh, humans have evolved with the microbiome and the composition of the microbiome specifically is a very important component of human health. So the short answer is that the microbiome is tolerated and it probably plays a very important role. It is It is recognized in some cases the body knows it's there, and the microbiome plays an important role in priming the immune system, especially in mucosal sites like the gut, the mouth, and other sites of entry into the body. And then the cells that reside in those sites are programmed a bit differently than the cells that might be circulating throughout the body ready to fight off a virus. The cells at those mucosal sites, they also receive signals from the microbiome, which programs those cells to be in a state of readiness, but not to attack the site with the microbiome present. And so those cells are ready to receive a heightened signal that would go above any signal presented by the microbiome from the pathogen recognition receptor. And then the threshold of signals that leads to the immune response in this case would have to meet a certain level before it triggers the actions of those immune cells. So what you're basically saying is that the the immune system 
is incredibly smart, if we can even give it that kind of terminology, to be able to recognize stuff that's okay and we can live with and stuff that's dangerous and might kill us. So let's segue back to the innate immune system, because that's an area of your specialty. And it's my understanding that the innate immune system is fast. In other words, when that virus or bacteria or whatever that invades us and it's dangerous, that innate immune system goes to work really fast. And and that's what triggers perhaps the the fever and the recognition that there's something there and that the immune system has to go on alert. Give us a little more in, insight into that innate immune system, and then we'll move on to the adaptive immune system, which I think is a little more confusing for people. Yeah, absolutely. So the innate immune system, you can think of it as an immune response that takes place on the molecular level actually inside an infected cell. So we are built such that our cells themselves have to, they have to protect themselves just like our immune system as a whole protects our body. And to protect the integrity of the cell, the cell has processes to respond to virus infection. So as I said earlier, the pathogen recognition receptor, recognizing the foreign nucleic acid from a virus infection becomes activated after it binds to that nucleic acid. And that allows it to bind to other molecules inside the cell. And those molecules then bind or alter other molecules. And we call this a signal transduction pathway. Within that pathway are key molecules that we call transcription factors. And then they get activated and they go into the nucleus and they turn on gene expression. The genes that get turned on are not your normal daily housekeeping genes that take care of us and process food and, and uh, oxygen and all that. The genes that get turned on are actually there to fight off virus infection. Those genes, when they're turned on, and there's literally hundreds of them, they're meant to be turned on for a short period of time because if they're turned on, for too long, it becomes toxic. So what happens is this response occurs very fast after virus infection, basically within hours, maybe even minutes, but certainly within hours. The transcription factor after the pathogen recognition receptor turns on the pathway, the transcription factor turns on genes that fight off the infection. And some of those genes are genes that encode molecules that are actually secreted from the infected cell. We call those cytokines, but the important thing is they're secreted into the tissue and into the blood. And so when they get into the tissue and the blood, they're sensed by other cells, other cells that get recruited to the site of infection by following the cytokine trail, so to speak, that came out of that infected cell. And then within hours, there's a concerted event by the innate immune response to surround the site of infection, to kill the infected cells if the cell itself cannot shut down virus infection, and then to clean up the mess when it's done. And that's all geared to take place over a period of hours and a few days. And if it works, we don't get sick. And this, this process I just described protects us every day on a daily basis. If you get the sniffles, that's your body, that's your innate immune response taking charge of something that's going on in your, in your airway. If you get sick from that process and are bedridden for days and weeks, the pathogen is winning. And so the, the strength of the innate immune response is very dependent on these pathogen recognition receptors and the activity of the genes that get turned on to fight off the infection. Dr. Gale, I know a lot of people are wondering, is there anything we can do to support 
our innate immunity to bolster it so that if we did happen to encounter a, a stray SARS-CoV-2 virus, it would be able to handle it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know, I could probably phrase that as probably what people would call clean living because we know all this, all the all this stuff out there, drugs, alcohol, smoking, obesity, suppresses the innate immune system. Staying in shape and moderating everything else is probably the best thing you can do for innate immune health. And I've been reading a lot about vitamin D lately and how important it is in general for the immune system and in particular against COVID-19. And I'm wondering if vitamin D plays a role in the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. Vitamin D is a, is a great molecule because it provides many metabolites that um, feed into processes of our own nucleic acid synthesis and, for example, our electron transport chain, the process by which cells utilize oxygen. If, for example, if either of those processes are compromised because of low levels of vitamin D or interruption with vitamin D metabolism, then the immune response suffers. And I'm assuming that uh, around Seattle, you probably do see people who have low vitamin D, particularly in the wintertime, because Seattle is pretty far north and may not get that much sunshine. Yeah, I think most of the northern states probably say they suffer from that. And yeah, vitamin D is... Um, an interesting molecule because, um, you know, it's metabolized after um, engaging receptors on or in cells. And a lot of those cells happen to be immune cells. So um, deficiencies in vitamin D, especially in northern states, I think there's actually data to support this, are um, associated with increases in autoimmunity and susceptibility to infection because of some level of immune suppression in lower than effective amounts of vitamin D. And vitamin D, as you know, it's a, it's very, the sunlight is very important in releasing vitamin D precursors from our internal stores. Now, Dr. Gale, in addition to things like vitamin D, and I suspect some other nutrients as well, our body responds to invasion with a fever, an elevation in temperature. And it's not just humans. A lot of creatures raise their temperature when they have an infection. I'm wondering if that's part of the innate fast immune response or if, if that's part of the adaptive immune system. What you're describing is fever and inflammation. We call it inflammation, and it's part of both. The inflammatory response is often initiated in parallel with the innate immune response. That's very interesting to consider. The inflammatory response is triggered by its own set of pathogen recognition receptors. The innate immune response is geared to turn on genes that are going to fight off the virus. The inflammatory response is geared to turn on genes that are going to increase inflammation by drawing in immune cells to the site of infection and um, eventually raising, you know, raising a fever. That inflammatory process, as we called it, is initiated by a unique set of molecules that can recognize different parts of pathogens. And we call those molecules inflammasomes because they turn on inflammation. So the inflammasomes and the innate immune response get activated sometimes in parallel. Sometimes inflammation will come later after innate immune response is turned on. And sometimes it might come first. The order of events could be critical for outcome. We're not sure yet, but both of these responses happen and they play a major role in programming later the adaptive immune response. Well, we'll talk about the adaptive immune response in a moment, but first we just have about two minutes left 
And I'm wondering if suppressing a fever, reducing a fever, you know, maybe it's up to 102, if that's counterproductive and if we should allow the body to do its thing. And the other question has to do with inflammation. We always think, oh, inflammation's bad. We, we need to calm inflammation with an anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or naproxen. Maybe that's a mistake. Yeah, that's that's those are good points. The um you know, the second point is that those ibuprofen, for example, will give you systemic suppression. You know, you take it orally and you swallow it and it dissolves and then it basically goes into the bloodstream and circulates through your whole body. So that will give you systemic suppression of inflammation, at least temporarily, to some degree. When we're infected with a virus, we need to have a certain amount of inflammation that is drawing in those critical innate and adaptive immune cells to the site of infection in order to suppress the spread of the virus. So the early stages of inflammation are actually important to contain the virus, protect the tissues. However, if the inflammation is sustained and goes on too long, it's very deleterious, can damage tissue, and be lethal. And I think a lot of people know what sepsis is. This is sepsis is an incredibly bad inflammatory response that has become systemic. The whole body is basically engaged in inflammation, and that can have a lethal outcome. So we want to avoid sepsis. So if inflammation, if a physician sees that inflammation is is going on too long, if it's going out of control, then yes, the approach is to try to shut it down, to give anti-inflammatories and even stronger drugs that will shut down the immune response and the invasion of the infected tissue to shut down inflammation. So there's a fine tuning that has to take place. The ideal situation is innate immunity would be activated when the, after the virus infects us. Then inflammation would come on shortly thereafter. Inflammation would stick around long enough to bring in the army of cells that are needed to stop the spread of the virus. And then once the spread is stopped and the innate immune response has cleared out the virus, then the inflammatory response will shut off. Those are more or less a normal cadence of events. You're listening to Dr. Michael Gale, Jr. He's a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale is an immunologist and virologist. He focuses his research on understanding the molecular mechanisms of the innate immune response and immune programming against infection by RNA viruses, including emerging SARS-CoV-2, emerging flaviviruses, HIV, and influenza viruses. After the break, we'll find out more about your army of cells that repel pathogens. What happens when SARS-CoV-2 and the immune system collide? Exactly what is a cytokine storm, and why is it so serious? SARS-CoV-2 is sneaky and tries to disable part of the immune response. We'll find out about future possibilities for overcoming SARS-CoV-2. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This People's Pharmacy podcast is brought to you in part by Verisana.com. Verisana Lab offers home health tests that allow you to monitor your hormones and health conditions. You can take control of the quantitative assessment of your health and learn about male and female hormone balance, the stress hormone cortisol, leaky gut, gluten intolerance, or your gut microbiome. Take a more active role in tracking your health and take 20% off your first order of a mail-in testing opportunity with the discount code PEOPLE. That's uppercase P-E-O-P-L-E. To learn more, go to verisana.com. That's V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com.
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Cocoa Via Memory Plus, a supplement with 750 milligrams of cocoa flavanols, the plant-based nutrients from fresh cocoa that help support memory. More information at cocovia.com. Also by Verisana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome, now with an annual health club plan. Online at verisana.com slash health dash club. Today, we're delving into immunology and virology to better understand how the immune system overcomes viral invaders. Our immune system is incredibly complex. It knows how to act quickly to repel pathogens, usually without harming us, the host. But sometimes the immune system goes into overdrive. It doesn't know how to calm down, and the result can be disastrous. We're talking with Dr. Michael Gale, Jr. He's a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale's research laboratory is focused on understanding the processes that trigger and control innate immunity and inflammation to program the immune response against RNA virus infections. He and his colleagues also seek to define the virus-host interactions that control viral replication and the outcome of infection and immunity. They are part of the Consortium for the Development and Advancement of Broad-Spectrum Respiratory Antivirals, which are what we need in part to overcome the coronavirus. Dr. Gale, you were just describing the normal course of how the body responds to an infection, and you mentioned an army of cells that comes out to um, greet or not greet, basically, uh, um, repel a pathogen that is trying to invade. Tell us more about that army of cells, please. Is that the adaptive immune system? The short answer is Yes and no. The army involves, first of all, what we call innate immune cells, neutrophils, uh, specific other myeloid cells, we call them neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, for example, show up at the site of infection and they attract other cells. They go to work to clear out the infection, but then additionally, things like natural killer cells and the word Natural killer pretty much describes them because they can come in and identify an infected cell and kill it. And if that army, they work cooperatively, and if um, they win the battle, then that's the end of the infection, uh, game over for the virus. But oftentimes, they don't do the job themselves, so they call in the adaptive immune response, which are T cells, B cells, largely. And these are lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are circulating in our body all the time. But when uh, they are called into action against specific viruses or specific pathogens, they will expand and go to work and attack the site of infection. Dr. Gale, if you can help us understand what happens with SARS-CoV-2 what the normal course of events would be from the time that we first get that viral load that triggers the innate immune system and then that delayed reaction when the adaptive immune system kicks in. And then for some folks, what happens when it goes haywire and we have what's been referred to as the cytokine storm? and maybe why some people do great and get over it and almost don't even know they've been infected and other people are on a downhill slope. Absolutely. The immune response to SARS-CoV-2 we're learning is very dynamic, it means it can be different in, in a great variety of uh, people across the population. Typically, let's say in a Young, a young adult infected with SARS-CoV-2, you know, most of the young adults are asymptomatic because after they've been exposed, the virus will replicate in their airway and the innate immune response will, pathogen recognition receptors will sense that virus and the innate immune response will contain it and eventually clear it out. They might get the sniffles in the process or a slight cough, but, but they resolve the infection pretty quickly because of that. 
But when the adaptive immune response against SARS-CoV-2 is engaged because the virus has progressed into the lung, say from the nose, now there's a different set of um, different level of engagement here. The virus has um, at that point encountered the lung. It's spread severely across the lung tissue. And then the innate immune response has not been able to contain it, but it's still active trying to contain it. What the innate immune response is doing at that point in time is generating a large amount of cytokines. And the large amount is primarily in part because the infection has spread across the tissue, across the lung, and there are many cells now that are infected. And each of those cells is mounting an innate immune response of its own and sending out cytokines that will recruit the army of cells to come in and try to clear out the infection. So what you get is this cytokine storm, as it's called, because there's an overabundance of cytokines. The cytokines attract an overabundance of cells to come to the site of infection. The cytokine storm continues as long as the virus is there triggering the pathogen recognition receptors. So this is almost a circuitous event. The cytokine keeps being pumped out. The pathogen recognition receptors keep signaling because the infection is spreading. And more and more cells from the army of immune cells that are to fight off the infection show up at the site of infection. So the outcome is a vastly increased inflammation. Um, the innate immune response is generating now and linking now with an, a massive inflammatory response. And then on top of it, we've learned that the virus in its own genome encodes directions to viral proteins to shut down parts of the innate immune response of the infected cell. So a very critical part of that response, we call it the interferon response, is shut down. And so the cell becomes immune compromised, if you will, in a sea of inflammatory soldiers trying to fight off the infection. And the end result is a runaway inflammation that becomes, in some cases, lethal because of this underlying cytokine storm. It's pretty sneaky of the virus to shut down part of the cell's immune response, isn't it? Yes, it's a very sneaky. So most of the viruses that make us sick have ways to do just that. Some viruses will shut down the innate immune response, at least part of it, only for a brief period of time, the time needed to replicate and get out of the cell, or the time needed to get past a critical point of replication where the cell might be able to shut it down. But this virus, the reports um, from various labs around the world are telling us that this virus compromises the innate immune response at multiple levels, multiple branches of it. So the cell, the infected cell itself becomes severely immunocompromised, leading to these sorts of outcomes with the cytokine storm, for example. Well, it, it almost sounds a, a bit like HIV because the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS also compromises the immune system. That's a very accurate parallel assessment. So HIV compromises the adaptive immune system. In essence, it depletes the body of the critical T helper cells needed to, keep the, to help the immune response. So people are become immune compromised. In this case, the SARS coronavirus compromises on the molecular level the innate immune response. So the innate immune response is highly compromised. And that means the adaptive immune response isn't going to work right. Oftentimes leads to runaway inflammation. Now, Dr. Gale, one quick question, if I may. There are a lot of folks, maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, who, who don't even know they've been infected. They're, they're totally asymptomatic. They, they have no problem whatsoever, and they get over 
something they didn't even know they had. And some folks have said, well, maybe it's because they've got these T cells that have been exposed to other coronaviruses or cold viruses or or somehow the immune system has been primed to shut down SARS-CoV-2 even before it has a chance to do damage. Is that a viable hypothesis? It's a viable hypothesis because of the similarity of many parts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus compared to other common coronaviruses that circulate and cause just minor colds in people. You can consider that molecules like antibodies can recognize features of a virus. And if that feature is shared on SARS-CoV-2 in a in a normal replicating uh, circulating coronavirus, then the, that same coronavirus antibody would ideally bind to SARS-CoV-2 and neutralize it. So cross-neutralizing antibodies, cross-reactive antibodies, and then cross-reactive immune cells in general could play a role in controlling virus. But most of the outcome, what leads mostly to outcome on the immune level is going to be innate in in the actions of the adaptive immune response. Dr. Gale, I wonder if you can tell us about the initiatives of your research laboratory in the global fight against SARS-CoV-2. What are you most excited about that you are doing as research? My group studies innate immunity to viruses and mostly to RNA viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, and uh, we work closely with with other people who study coronaviruses. So we are able to leverage a lot of the tools we already had in place, if you will, our toolbox of of things we use in experiments to start working on SARS-CoV-2. The immediate goal is to understand how the virus is sensed as non-self, or in some cases, how the virus might not be sensed at all. How might it escape sensing? We're studying the virus on the molecular level to ask how the viral nucleic acid is recognized as a foreign invader. And we're studying the virus more on a tissue level in um, lung donor slices, for example, in culture. How does the virus infect the intact tissue and what is the innate immune response inside that intact tissue and how does it work to control the virus. If we can understand all of those features of infection, the goal is to identify innate immune genes, like I said, those genes that get turned on in response to virus infection. Identify the genes that are important for fighting off SARS-CoV-2, and then identify small molecule therapeutics that one could apply towards therapeutically turning those genes on So somebody could take some medication that turns on their innate immune response at that level to turn on those particular genes to fight off SARS-CoV-2 infection and stop the disease from progressing. So that's, that's our interest overall. We're also engaged on a number of fronts, including developing vaccine. And I'm also work as part of the group that helped launch one of the vaccines that's now in uh, phase three trials uh, across the United States and elsewhere. And so we're also involved in uh, diagnostics and then determining the gene signature, if you will, of the innate immune response in patients who are actually infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then using that signature to tell us what's important about controlling the infection and controlling the disease. So on all of those fronts, the goal is to eventually identify therapeutic targets that could be used to treat people. And what does your crystal ball tell you in terms of the future of overcoming SARS-CoV-2 and really putting COVID-19 in the rearview mirror? There's a lot of action going on across the entire world. As you know, you've, I think you've heard about all the vaccines that are being developed, new therapeutics, prophylactics to block the virus from actually even binding to its receptor on the cells, new therapeutic drugs. These are all in the pipeline. From my own work, 
we've already amassed enough information that we think we know how the virus could be recognized and how we might be able to interfere with that process to alleviate a cytokine storm but enhance the process early in infection to suppress infection. So overall, my crystal ball says that it's remarkable, number one, that the scientists across the world were able to leverage their tools, so to speak, that they work with in the lab on a daily basis to investigate the molecular biology, the virology, and the immunology of this virus and and the COVID-19 disease that it causes. That's quite remarkable. The contribution from the global scientific community is absolutely outstanding. And because of that, within a year, we'll have a vaccine supplied to the population to prevent infection. And because of that, we'll have new therapeutics on the table sometime after that, that if this virus ever shows up again, or another cousin of SARS shows up again, we'll be more prepared for it. Dr. Michael Gale, thank you very much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. You're welcome. Thanks. You've been listening to Dr. Michael Gale, Jr. He's a professor of immunology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Gale is an immunologist and virologist. He and his colleagues in the Gale Laboratory focus their research on understanding the molecular mechanisms of innate immune response and immune programming against infection by RNA viruses, including emerging SARS-CoV-2, emerging flaviviruses, HIV, and influenza viruses. Case counts of COVID-19 are rising rapidly in many parts of the world. Places like Germany, France, the Netherlands, Russia, Italy, and the UK are seeing cases spike. So are many parts in the U.S. States such as North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Montana, and Wyoming are suffering. So are Idaho, Utah, and Nebraska. Until we have a vaccine or an effective antibody treatment, we'll have to help our immune systems out by keeping our distance from potential virus carriers. Lynn Siegel produced today's show, Al Wodarski Engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Verizana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome, online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com. And by Cocovia Memory Plus, a cocoflavanol supplement backed by four clinical studies that show significant improvement in three different aspects of memory. More information at Cocovia dot com. If you'd like to purchase a CD of today's show or any other People's Pharmacy episode, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is number 1,233. That number again, 800-732-2334. You can also find it at our website, peoplespharmacy.com. When you visit the website, you can share your thoughts about today's show. You can subscribe to our podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Google, or your favorite podcast provider. It's posted on our website every Monday morning. When you go to the website, you could sign up for the free online newsletter. Get the latest news about COVID-19 and other important health stories. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. 
All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.